Thank you, everybody. As Christy mentioned, this is Tim Donahue from DuraSpace, um, and today we're going to be talking about integrating DSpace with DuraCloud. Uh, before I get started here, I do want to give a little side note. Um, I've had some massive technical difficulties this morning, unfortunately. Um, so the demo that I had planned, um, that I had gone through, that was really flashy and cool, I'm unfortunately not going to be able to do today. Uh, basically, what happened was uh, my internet is down, and now I'm currently talking to you live from my local public library um, in a private room, of course. But um, my, my capabilities here are not as they were back at home. So unfortunately, the demo portion I'm going to have to cut out. But I will post up a, a screencast that shows an exact demo of how you can actually use the DSpace user interface um, to integrate directly with DuraCloud. So today is going to be more just talking through um, what's going on behind the scenes and what technologies uh, we're using to actually perform this integration. So I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, the basis for the DSpace integration really comes from a couple tools that have come into uh, DSpace within the last couple major versions. Uh, the main tool that we're using for this sort of DuraCloud integration is the AIP backup and restore tool. So AIP is archival information packages. Uh, it's an OAIS term for those who are familiar with the OAI, OAIS reference model. Um, and essentially, uh, that's what we're using to actually perform the backups and restores to and from DuraCloud. Um, and that came out in DSpace 1.7. So it's been available since 1.7.0. We're also going to be uh, talking a little bit about the curation task system, which is another tool that is used in this integration. That also came out in 170 and received some updates, some significant updates in the most recent 1.8 release. And the main uh, thing that's built on these two underlying technologies is the DSpace replication task suite, which is a brand new add-on that we will be releasing an early release version of in early December. Um, and it's compatible with 1.8. Uh, so you'll be able to install this on an existing DSpace 1.8 instance. And it allows you to perform this sort of seamless integration between DSpace and DuraCloud to perform seamless backups and restores, both from the DSpace user interface, as well as from a command line or a scheduled sort of process behind the scenes. So this is the basis for um, what we'll be talking about today. Um, and with that, I'm just going to start to dive in. First, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction of what the AIP Backup and Restore tool does uh, for those of you who may not have used it before um, and how we can utilize that technology in the replication task suite to actually perform this seamless integration with DuraCloud. So, First, we need to do a little intro to the archival information packages, the AIPs. Again, this came out in DSpace 1.7. Um, and the primary use case here was to allow you to do a backup and restore of your DSpace content. Not only the entire, you could do the entire DSpace all at once, or you can do just individual communities, collections, or items, um, and pick and choose what you either want to backup or what you want to restore. If, only you, if you only need to restore a few items, or a single collection or community. Uh, it can also be used because it can perform that full backup and restore in a DSpace install. You can use it to migrate content from one DSpace to another. Again, you could migrate an entire DSpace to a fresh installation. Um, you could also uh, just migrate partial content. You could migrate one community from a dark uh, DSpace installation that may not be accessible to the public to a live um, public accessible DSpace installation. And the final use case, of course, here is what we'll be talking about more is the DuraCloud integration, which allows you to do this off-site backup and restore of DSpace content um, off into DuraCloud, obviously. So digging into this a little bit more, I want to talk a little bit about why this came about and why this AIP backup and restore is important. Um, the main reason here and I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because some of you may have heard this uh, spiel a little bit back at um, open repositories. I gave a similar uh, spiel, um, at least in the, um, the DuraCloud workshop at the open repositories, as well as a couple other places. But in general, 
um, before DSpace 1.7, before we could back up with these AIPs, when you would back up your DSpace install, you'd have to do two backups. You'd have to try and sync these up as best you can. You'd back up your database, and then you'd back up your asset store folder, which is where all the actual DSpace files are, the, the content. Um, and you'd want to back those up and, and sync them as best as you possibly could, but of course that's two separate backups there. And similarly, when you're restoring everything before 1.7 and before AIP, is you do two separate restores. You'd be restoring your entire database, and then you'd restore all of your files uh, back into your asset store folder. And so that's all fine and good. It's not too difficult. But what came to be very complex before AIPs came about was when you wanted to restore just a single bit of content into your DSpace install. So if you needed to restore just a single collection or a single community because it somehow got corrupted or you accidentally ran a script that, that uh, changed everything improperly in your database or whatever, um, if you wanted to do that single restoration of just part of your content, it was a much more complex process before AIPs. You'd often have to first um, do a full restore off to like a temporary database and just pull out those particular tables or columns or whatever out of that database to restore to your production instance, while at the same time trying to figure out what files you actually needed to pull out of your backup to restore just those items that needed to be restored. So it wasn't a very straightforward way to restore partial content. You could always do a full restoration of DSpace, but restoring parts of your DSpace install were much more complex. And so we came to realize this is much too difficult of a restoration process if you just need to deal with a single corrupted collection, a single corrupted item, um, or just you know somebody accidentally deleted something. They deleted the wrong collection, they deleted the wrong item. You don't want to have to necessarily go back and restore all of your DSpace in those, in in those instances. So this is where um, the idea of these archival information packages come about. Um, what's going on here is we're actually able to, when we back up your DSpace install, we create a separate zip file for every single object in your DSpace. So a separate package for every single object in your DSpace. So that's a single package that describes a community, a single package that could describe a single collection, um, a single package could describe a single item. And so if you actually had a collection that existed um, in your DSpace that had 20 items within that collection, if you back up that collection, you'd end up with 21 archival information packages. You'd have 20, which represent those 20 items, and one that describes that particular uh, collection within your DSpace. And I'm going to go into more detail as to how these archival packages get um, created. This is just sort of the introductory um, how a backup sort of happens. So if you're backing up your entire DSpace, you're going to be backing up them all to uh, every single object. It's in a different zip file package and it goes off to your backup location, whether that's on tape, in DuraCloud, or wherever. Similarly, um, the opposite, if you're restoring everything, you can restore everything via a series of these zip files, um, these zipped up content that include both the, the, um, the actual files themselves, the content files, as well as metadata. So in the case of items, you have both the content files for those items as well as the metadata, all contained within an item zip package. So with your restoration, you're doing the opposite. You're able to pull these zip files into DSpace, and it will unzip those files and restore all your content back based on this series of archival information packages. But the thing that's really powerful about these is when you're restoring just partial bits of content, uh, rather than having to go and create temporary locations or whatever like we had to do with trying to restore a single collection from uh, your database backup and your asset store backup, now it's a little bit more powerful in that you can just restore your single collection AIP package, which is a single zip file. You can upload that into your DSpace and it will unzip that and say, oh, I have a collection here. Okay, I'm restoring this collection's content. And this collection claims that it had 20 items within it um, at the time when it was last backed up. So, okay, I'm going to go off and request those 20 item AIP packages as well 
and restore those as the second part of my restoration process. So it's really a much easier restoration. You're really just uploading this collection AIP file and then DSpace knows to go and request all of the item AIPs that existed within those collection, um, within that collection so that it's actually able to restore that collection back to the exact state that it was in uh, when you last backed it up. So this is the main reason why um, we wanted to go towards this route of AIP backup and restore is to try and simplify the way that you can restore individual objects, individual items, individual collections, or individual communities within your DSpace system. And again, this backup location can be your hard drive, it can be a, um, a SAN, um, a local network storage, it could be DuraCloud. So this is all um, examples of just ways to back up DSpace. So moving on here, um, what's actually in an AIP package? As I mentioned, um, these are zip files. So it's a single zip file per object. Um, inside that zip file, uh, maybe one or more content files, um, if this zip file represents an item. Um, if it represents a community or a collection, then the community or collection logo could be um, in there if that community or collection has a logo. Um, it also has a core METS file. The METS file is just a XML packaging structure that actually contains all of the metadata uh, that represents that particular object within DSpace. So for items, this would contain all of the, um, the DSpace internal metadata, the Dublin core that is um, on that particular item, things like the author, the title, um, everything about that item. For a community or a collection, this would actually contain some basic metadata that exists on communities and collections within DSpace, namely the community or collection name, uh, the description, uh, the sort of short, short name, um, and sort of basic information there. In addition, in that METS file, it also contains uh, some rights information. So basically who has what rights on that particular object within DSpace. So we're able to restore not only these objects into your DSpace installation, but allows us to restore them with the exact um, rights on those objects. So the groups and the people that have particular rights um, on those objects. And that includes things like the ability to submit content into a collection. Um, that's actually described in a collection AIP. We can say these particular groups can actually submit new items into this collection, and that's described within that METS file for that, that describes that collection. So there could also be um, text licenses for items that were submitted. There also may be some other uh, files within there that may be sort of thumbnail images or things like that. Um, essentially, the basic idea here is that an AIP is described mostly by this METS file, which contains all the metadata, contains all the rights information, as well as some um, te technical metadata internal to DSpace. And then that met alongside that METS file are one or more various sort of content files or other things that are, that are um, within that particular DSpace object, whether that object is an item, collection, or community. And so it's also worth mentioning here that uh, these AIPs by default in DSpace out of the box, they only are described in METS. So the, the METS uh, file is the main descriptor within that AIP. In the replication suite add-on, um, which is what I'll be talking about later, we also offer a different format for these AIPs, which is a Bagot packaging format. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the Bagot packaging uh, structure. Um, and that's just another option for how you may want to package up your AIPs based on your local needs or desires. So um, again, that METS file is the central thing in that AIP. It links off and describes the content files that also exist within that AIP. It also may describe other related objects. So for a collection, that METS file will say this collection contains these 20 items and give um, links off to those item AIPs so that it, DSpace is really um, easily able to tell, you know, when I'm restoring this collection, how do I go off and restore all these item, items alongside it? So the METS is that central 
thing that does all that. Again, I said it, it, um, it contains various types of metadata. There's descriptive metadata in the form of DIM, which is the DSpace internal um, Dublin core, as well as mods. So it's uh, got a mod um, description as well. Uh, there's technical and preservation metadata in premise, and then there's some rights-based information, permission stuff in the METS rights uh, schema. Um, so that's just the basic information about how that METS package is generated. There's also a special AIP here that's generated when you back up your entire DSpace site, and that's basically called the site AIP. It doesn't really describe an object within DSpace, but it actually describes your DSpace installation itself. So it contains some basic metadata about your DSpace installation, namely sort of the, the, the title that you gave your DSpace installation, um, and then it links off to the various top level uh, communities that exist within that DSpace install. And this becomes very important because it's also the place that holds all of the groups that exist within your DSpace install and the e-people that, that are members of those groups. And it allows us to restore those groups and those people into those groups um, whenever you need to do a full uh, restoration of your entire DSpace. So that's just worth noting that this is a special form of AIP that's generated for your DSpace instance. Um, so the question comes up then, what can these AIPs restore? Are they just as good as that traditional double backup where you back up your database and your file system, or are there some limitations here? Um, and the answer is, is there are a couple limitations, but these actually can restore the vast majority of, well, important content or things that you need to actually archive, things that are already archived within your DSpace installation. So they're very important for preservation purposes for these backup and restore of content. It can actually restore all of your in-archive content, so anything that's actually made it into your DSpace archive. It can restore all of the people and groups, like I mentioned, all of the permissions and access rights given to those people and groups, restore your entire community, uh, collection and item hierarchy within your DSpace, as well as the community and collection logos, metadata, rights, um, even item templates that exist within your collections. Though the limitations that it does have is that currently they do not restore items that are still in process or incomplete. So this is anything that someone's working on submitting, but they actually haven't pushed that submit button yet. Um, so things like that are not currently stored and back, uh, backed up in these AIPs. The AIPs are more about storing content that has already made it into your DSpace archive. Uh, there's also one uh, minor limitation to collections in that currently AIPs uh, cannot describe uh, any sort of harvest settings if you have a harvesting collection. So currently in DSpace, you actually can set up a collection to harvest from an external location. Uh, we cannot save the harvesting settings, but we can save anything that you had previously harvested. So anything that was already harvested into your DSpace from an external site via either OAI PMH or OAI ORE, um, that content would get restored. And it, currently, it does not restore any of your DSpace configuration. So things like your DSpace config file and any other configuration file um, you'd want to back those up separately if you ever needed to restore your DSpace configurations. But as you can see, it does a great job of doing the preservation, uh, rest, rest, or backup and restoration of content for DSpace. So as I mentioned, there's a couple different use cases. I kind of showed a basic sort of backup and restore in a diagram. Uh, this is sort of how you could migrate content from one DSpace to another, again, in a diagram sort of format. Um, and I've numbered these errors because this is sort of the general um, steps that take place. So from your one DSpace installation, you can actually say, okay, export this collection into an AIP. And the first thing your DSpace will do is it will export a collection AIP, and it will realize that collection in this DSpace has say 20 items. And so the second step is that it will now export 20 different item AIPs um, and link them up to that collection AIP. So those will be exported to wherever you tell DSpace to export to. 
And then in your other D space install, the one you're migrating to, you can say, okay, now in this other D space, I'm going to import this collection um, from, from where I had exported it to, in which case it pulls up that collection AIP, realizes there's a bunch of item AIPs that are related to it and pulls those in as well. So that allows you to move collections from one D space to another. And again, this export location can be their local file system. It can be DuraCloud. Um, it can be um, a sort of uh, local storage area, a SAN or, or any sort of network storage. So in DSpace 1.7, you actually can do backups to DuraCloud um, in 1.7 in a much more manual fashion. I just wanted to kind of mention this, um, that DSpace 1.7 allowed you to do this via a command line tool that DSpace offers alongside a command line tool that DuraCloud offers. So it was a two-step manual process with DSpace 1.7. You'd first export these AIPs using the DSpace Packager tool, that uh, first command line tool numbered one on the slide. Um, and then you uh, tell, use a DuraCloud sync tool to actually sync those files from that export directory up into DuraCloud. So this was a little bit of a more manual process to allow you to move content from DSpace up to DuraCloud. Um, again, this is for DSpace 1.7. We've made it a lot simpler with the new replication task suite, which I'll talk about here shortly. Um, again, it's a little bit more manual in DSpace 1.7 to actually restore from DuraCloud, but it is possible. Uh, the first step would be to use the DuraCloud um, retrieval tool, which again is a command line tool offered by DuraCloud to pull your content um, out of the cloud and down to a local folder. So you pull down your AIPs from DuraCloud. And then once they're down in your local folder, you can use the DSpace Packager tool to, um, to load up those AIP files back into your DSpace and restore whatever content was in those AIP files. So again, a little bit more of a manual process, but we've made it a lot simpler with the replication task suite which is what I'm going to be talking about next. So again, this is an add-on for DSpace 1.8. Um, it doesn't come out of the box in DSpace 1.8, uh, but we're making it as, as simple to install as possible, uh, as well as we're gonna offer up a, a DSpace 1.8 version that has it pre-installed. So if you actually wanted to just download that 1.8 version with it pre-installed, you could just run it that way. So, before I get into the replication suite, I do want to touch briefly on the fact that it uses the DSpace curation system, um, which again I had mentioned early on came out in 1.7, and this is what the replication task suite is entirely built on, so it's worth understanding. Um, the curation system for DSpace basically enables a sort of microservices approach um, to uh, running tasks across one or more objects within DSpace. Um, these tasks could be built by anyone, but currently they need to be built um, in Java, although we do have some experimental support to do um, some non-Java-based tasks. We're working on ways to be able to build tasks in things like JRuby or similar. Um, right now, uh, that support is extremely experimental, so we really only fully support um, Java-based tasks. But the idea is that when someone builds a little simple task, it's a sim single Java class that can then be executed either from the DSpace administrative user interface kicked off by an administrator of DSpace or in the tra traditional sort of command line mode. You can also queue these tasks up into sort of a, a queue to actually be run later. Um, so you can actually say I want to run these three tasks later tonight and then have some sort of process come through later on the, in the night and actually run anything off of that queue to export tasks in more of an overnight fashion. So I just wanted to, to mention that uh, this is now available in DSpace 1.7. If you've been in a recent version of DSpace, you're probably pretty familiar with this. It's a really powerful tool, and we're building more and more of these small little tasks to perform very basic um, checks across various DSpace objects, uh, not only to do things like, um, like potentially do these sort of backups via tasks, but also doing simple things like a link checker task that came out in DSpace 1.8, which will go through all your metadata 
and double check that all of the links in your metadata, HTTP links, um, still actually resolve properly and warn you if any links are not resolving. So there's little powerful things you can do to just sort of curate your DSpace content with these various curation tasks. So one warning here, and sorry for the bright red. In DSpace 180, we noticed an unfortunate bug in the, in the curation task system, and this does affect uh, the replication task suite, which I'm gonna be talking about. Right now, if you run a task site-wide across all of your content within DSpace, in DSpace 180, um, you will always uh, get a null pointer exception error returned, um, no matter whether that succeeded or not. And in fact, most of the time, the task actually will succeed behind the scenes. It just reports a null pointer exception error because it runs into an error trying to build the success message, essentially. <laughs> Uh, which is an unfortunate small bug in DSpace 180 that we're going to be fixing in DSpace 181. Uh, the plan for 181 is that um, tentatively we're hoping to get it out uh, sometime in mid-December. Uh, if we don't hit the before the holidays sort of deadline, expect it you know early in January. But I think the current um, plan is to try and push out a really quick uh, DSpace 181. Um, in mid-December uh, to fix this minor bug, along with a couple other small things that we noticed just after we released 1.8.0. So I just wanted to warn people about that. Um, this does affect um, the replication task suite, which I'm going to talk about as well here. Um, so the replication task suite is kind of what it sounds like. It's a set of these curation tasks. It's a suite of tasks. Um, that's actually geared towards what we're just generically terming replicating content. Um, and that replication of content can be the backup, the restoration of content, as well as um, auditing your, your DSpace content, your current content in your DSpace against what's in your backup. So you can see if something has changed either in your uh, current existing DSpace content or something happened to change you know, in your backup and figure out whether or not uh, you need to do a, another backup or another restoration or whatever to, to sync those back up. Um, again, this is compatible with DSpace 1.8, but we're highly recommending waiting until 1.8.1 to try this out. Um, as I mentioned, there's going to be an early release of this that will be released shortly. Um, I don't recommend running it in 1.8.0 just because of that previous bug that I just talked about. You could run it in 1.8.0 and things will work fine, but you will see those errors reported um, every time you run anything site-wide. Um, they're not detrimental errors necessarily, but they're a little bit annoying and a little bit disconcerting to your users. So I would recommend um, waiting until 181 just to avoid any sort of misunderstanding there. Um, what this suite of tasks actually does is it wraps um, the DSpace AIP Backup and Restore tool, which I just talked about, uh, that tool that generates these AIPs and is able to actually export them and import them into DSpace. This replication suite basically wraps the calls to that tool and makes them available through the curation task system so that you're now able to make these backup and restore calls directly from the DSpace user interface as need be, and you won't necessarily even have to touch the command line. You still can do it from command line. Um, and for very large restorations, uh, those are things you may still need to run on the command line or run in a queued fashion um, as well. Uh, but that's uh, it basically brings it up to the, the user interface level, and you can queue things from the user interface level as well. So you can queue them up to do a restoration overnight if you know you have to do a large restore of content at some point in time. Um, it also provides various storage plugins. There's various places you can replicate this content to. Uh, the main storage plugins that come out of the box with the replication suite are you can actually do the backups just to your local file system. Um, you can do them to a a mounted file system, so sort of like a SAN or some sort of network storage area, or you can do these backup and, and restores to DuraCloud, which is what we're talking about mostly today. So, um, 
So it's a very powerful suite of tools here that allows you to perform these backup and restores to your file system or DuraCloud um, and do that all from the DSpace user interface or queue things up from the DSpace user interface. The additional feature it provides is, as I had mentioned, by default, these AIPs are um, using a Metspace packaging structure, uh, which there's nothing wrong with Mets, but some people prefer different packaging structures. And so we decided to offer a separate Bagot-based packaging structure, which was built by MIT, because um, they primarily work with Bagot packages internally and want to continue to do so. So they're offered a separate format for DSpace AIPs um, in this Bagot sort of package rather than the Metspace package. So the suite of tasks that are offered um, within this replication task suite are all listed here. And I'm going to kind of go through these and explain what, what goes on and why you would want to use these sort of tasks. So the basic task is to transmit your AIPs, which is basically the, doing the backup. You're going to transmit them off to storage. Um, in the case of DuraCloud, which is what we're um, talking about here primarily, when you run this transmit AIP task from the user interface, it will actually package up whatever object you're looking at. So if you're looking at a collection, let's say, it will create a brand new AIP for that collection, create a brand new AIP for all of the items in that collection, and then auto upload them all right up to DuraCloud to your DuraCloud account. So it's doing that all in one step. It's a one step sort of uh, kickoff task. Once they're up in your DuraCloud account, you could then verify that everything is up there. So verify AIPs exist, you could basically kick off that task from that same collection, and it will run a quick checkup to your DuraCloud account or wherever you've backed up these AIPs to verify that every object that currently exists in your DSpace has an AIP that exists in your backup location. And that's just a very quick check. It's just looking based on um, what it expects the name of that AIP to be. Um, but there's a much more complex check that you can also run, which is a couple down, which is an actual audit. And what the audit does is it actually regenerates an AIP based on your local content in DSpace, gets a checksum from that newly generated AIP and compares that off to your backup location so that it can actually verify that nothing has changed between your DSpace install and your backup location. Um, if, if a single thing changes, if you change a metadata field in, in an item or change your collection title slightly, then when you regenerate that AIP, um, the checksum will be slightly different than the one um, in your backup location, and it will report back that the checksums differ. So you'll then want to do either a new, a new backup if you know that change needs to still be backed up. Or if it's a corruption issue, you could actually restore them. So this helps to prompt you when you may need to figure out whether or not uh, something needs restoration to your DSpace. There's also the ability to just fetch your AIPs, so you just download them in bulk. Um, this could be useful if you uh, wanted to actually uh, restore just a single item or something within your DSpace and you just wanted to grab down the AIP from DuraCloud in a very quick manner and take a look at it locally. Um, but it's more just sort of a, a tool just to do a quick download. Uh, there's also the ability to remove your backup AIPs uh, from that external location if you wanted to, if you no longer wanted them for whatever reason. And then you get into the kind of cool tools uh, near the end here. Uh, you can actually restore objects uh, to your DSpace instance that may be missing. So if something accidentally got deleted in your DSpace instance, you can restore that particular item or that particular collection from your backup AIPs that exist off in DuraCloud or your file system or wherever they're backed up to. Um, similarly, if something got corrupted, if uh, somebody went in and accidentally you know, messed up the metadata on an item somehow or, or you accidentally ran a script that that messed up the metadata on a couple items, you can actually go through and do a replacement of your existing content within DSpace and replace them back to the state that they were in um, at the point of your last backup. So this again would go off to DuraCloud or wherever your external storage is, download those AIPs from your backup for you, 
and then automatically do an unzip of those AIPs and restore that content directly into your DSpace instance. And so the only difference between restore and replace is that with a restore, you're restoring something that's missing. It no longer exists within your DSpace. With a replace, you're overriding something that actually currently exists. So a replace can be potentially dangerous in that you're actually going to override existing content, but it's extremely useful if something got corrupted or accidentally got messed up in your DSpace and you really just need to get back to that state that you were in um, during your last backup. We also provide a cool little tool um, that we call the Adometer, uh, which essentially takes, keeps track of all of your uploads and downloads that are taking place when you're doing all this transmitting of AIPs or um, restore or replacement when you're downloading those AIPs. And this is extremely useful for some, using something like DuraCloud because then you can get a good sense of how much content you're pushing up into DuraCloud and how much content you're pulling down from DuraCloud. Um, Dirk Cloud provides some, some of its own little statistical tools as well, uh, but this allows you to be able to track that content directly from your DSpace instance, and you can actually read this odometer again from your DSpace administrative user interface. So you could go in and just read your current odometer and see how much has been uploaded uh, into your backup location, your DuraCloud backup location, and how much you've downloaded, just to get a sense of, of how much content you're pushing up and down. We also provide a little tool that can actually estimate your storage size that you're going to need for a backup. And it's right now a very rough estimate. It's rough around the edges, um, but I'm sure it'll get better and better, um, especially as we get more people uh, involved with this tool and helping build new cool functionality here. Uh, so essentially what this does is just what it sounds like. It's going to give you an estimate of how much storage you need to back up, say, a particular collection if you ran it at a collection level. If you ran it at the site level, your entire DSpace site, it would actually give an estimate of how much storage you need to do a full backup of your DSpace site. Um, and again, it's a pretty rough estimate, but it's, it's a very nice feature to have so you know how much content you're working with there. Um, and again, uh, all of these tasks can be configured to store those AIPs up in your DuraCloud account. So either upload or download in an automated fashion. Uh, what you do is essentially hook it up to your DuraCloud account and provide a username and password to be able to do all this stuff behind the scenes. And then once that's hooked up to your DuraCloud account, these tasks are only available to uh, DSpace system administrators, so very trusted users in your DSpace um, instance, they can go in then and actually perform these backups and restores uh, directly to your DuraCloud account in a very seamless fashion. They, because again, all of the, your account information uh, is stored in a little configuration file uh, that these tasks use. So it's also, they all also support just uh, local backups to either a local storage or a mounted storage. So here's a basic example now of how this simplifies the backup uh, to DuraCloud. Previously, as I had mentioned, it's a, in one seven, you could actually perform these backups to DuraCloud, but it was a two-step process and you had to do both steps from the command line. Well, now with the replication task suite, you can run that transmit AIP task and you can run it from the command line still if you felt more comfortable that way, but most people probably want to kick it off from an administrative user interface. So you could actually go to your admin UI and just kick off a transmit my AIPs off to my backup location. And so uh, when you do that transmission, it will actually then at that point in time, create a package for each of your community's collections and items as we had mentioned, store them temporarily um, into a temp folder as it starts to upload each one, one by one into DuraCloud. And that temp folder is literally just a temporary cache. So it's not requiring you to have a whole lot of extra storage there. It's just a place that it can generate each of these packages temporarily before it uploads them automatically into your DuraCloud account. And so again, this happens in a seamless fashion. You can kick it off via the admin user interface. You can also queue it from the admin user interface and have something run um, on a nightly basis or a weekly basis based on how quickly you want to go through your queue and have it do that backup in a more automated fashion in that way. So similarly, 
the restoration is vastly simplified as well. It's a one-step process again. Again, you can run it from the administrative user interface of DSpace. So if you wanted to just restore a single item from your DSpace install, you can go to managing that particular item within your DSpace installation and run a task there that can actually do the replacement of that item from AIP, which immediately would go off to your DuraCloud account, find that item's AIP in your DuraCloud account, automatically download it to this temporary location, and then from there, unzip it into DSpace and uh, restore or replace that particular item within your DSpace installation. Again, completely seamless, all happening behind the scenes, doing the upload and download automatically to DuraCloud for you without having to worry about that. And again, this is also where you can run all the various auditing tools. You can check to see if, um, if the object in DSpace is still the same as the AIP inside DuraCloud by performing an audit um, or any sort of other auditing that you wanted to do. So here is where I was planning on performing the replication suite demo. Unfortunately, as I had mentioned previously, um, I have had some technical difficulties locally. Uh, my internet went down and I had to switch over. I'm now running on a laptop. And as quickly as I tried to get this demo up and running on my laptop, I needed probably an extra half an hour or an hour to get it fully functional for you. Um, so unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to show a demo, but I promise you that I will do a screencast of the demo that I would be showing um, and post that up to the uh, replication task suite uh, page where you'll both be able to download that code, uh, get information about how to install it, and then this demo will be posted up there so you can actually watch that demo at a later time. And again, this demo actually uh, was going to show you how you can do this all seamlessly from your DSpace administrative user interface without touching the command line at all. So you could do a full backup, full restore, uh, just backing up or restoring single communities, collections, or items um, from DSpace to DuraCloud and back again without touching the command line. Uh, so again, sorry for not being able to do the demo today, but I will post up a screencast shortly in the, the next day or so to actually show off um, exactly how this works from the DSpace administrative user interface. So the last few things that I do want to mention here before we can open up to questions is that there are a few limitations that we know of with the replication task suite. Um, currently, um, when you're doing these backups to DuraCloud, we cannot yet take advantage of DuraCloud streaming um, services capabilities within DuraCloud or the transformation services. So there's some basic uh, ability to transform file formats, especially image file formats, and some basic streaming, media streaming capabilities within DuraCloud. Currently, we're not able to take advantage of those because these AIPs are zip files. Um, we're investigating ways that in the future we could uh, take advantage of these in some way, shape, or form. Um, to allow that capability to come uh, become more seamless into DSpace. But currently, the, the replication task suite is really geared towards the backup and restore use case of getting stuff into DuraCloud and then um, restoring from your uh, external store, or your external backup um, into your DSpace. So the power here is more that DuraCloud provides that off-site backup location into the cloud um, that you can restore from if a uh, disaster happens locally uh, or if something just happens to be corrupted or you make a, a manual human mistake, as we all sometimes do, and accidentally delete something along those lines. So as I had mentioned, the early access release for the replication task suite uh, will be released here in early December, um, like actually next Monday is the, the timeline that we're looking at. Um, this release is primarily for early adopters to try out the add-on, to play around with it. Um, again, it's going to be compatible with DSpace 1.8, um, but we recommend even uh, waiting for 1.8.1 unless you just want to get your hands on it and play around with it a little bit before then. Um, but primarily, this, this early access release provides a way that, that we can give this out to the community to let you uh, give us some immediate feedback on it so that we can uh, fix issues if there's any issues that we notice 
make things even easier, if there's things that we can make even easier. Uh, the goal here is that we can hopefully have a, a 1.0 fully stable release of this sometime early in 2012. So like in the first quarter of 2012. Um, it will be downloadable from the Replication Task Suite page on the DSpace Wiki. If you just search for Replication on the Wiki or Replication Task Suite, you can find it there. And I've put the link up here as well. Um, and there's also already installation and configuration instructions that are already being built on that above page. And we'll get some more information there. And that's also the page where I will be posting uh, the actual screencast uh, demo that I meant to show here today. Um, the only other things to mention here is this work was not done <laughs> just by DuraSpace, of course. I was heavily involved, but MIT has also been very heavily involved primarily Richard Rogers and Wendy Bossens, as well as some more of their developers there at MIT. Uh, we also had some early help from Atmire, uh, primarily Mark Diggory, uh, but there are a few of their other developers there as well to help build out this replication task suite and do some, some live testing of things to make sure things are as, as stable as we can make them. Uh, but these are the primary uh, people, MIT, Atmire, and Duraspace have been involved with that, and so that's why this early adopter release is very important to get some feedback from the community, to have some people play around with it, let us know what you like, what, what may need a little bit more work, things like that. And so finally, uh, really for more information about any of these things that I've talked about today, here's those wiki links again. Um, so feel free to go peruse the information that's out there. Um, and as I mentioned, that first link is the place that you can go to download the replication task suite once, once it's available and also see the screencast that will be posted within the next few days. So that's it. And with that, we'll open it up for any questions you may have. Before we start with your questions, if everyone could do me a favor and go ahead and mute your personal phone line or Skype, I'm going to be taking everybody off mute and we just don't want to have a lot of background noise. We're going to have two ways in which you can ask questions. Um, first of all, you can ask it live to Tim. Just go ahead and speak your question. And the other way to do it is through the chat window. And once again, that's on the right-hand side of your screen. If you click on the conversation bubble, go all the way down to the end where it says two. You want to choose the participant duration, and you can send your questions in that way. So at this time, I'm going to unmute everybody, and I'm going to start with our first question, which came from Kevin. And his question is, is your use of AIP consistent with the way it is defined in ISO 14721, or is it an ad hoc usage? Uh, um, the usage of the term AIP is more of uh, an ad hoc usage, I believe, although I admit I'm not completely familiar with that particular ISO standard number off the top of my head. Um, it's, it's based on the definition of AIPs in the OAIS reference model. So based on that model, it actually is a full archival information package that describes everything about that object, all the metadata content, and, um, and technical information about that particular object. But these AIPs are generated based on DSpace itself. So they are somewhat DSpace specific, although as you would have noticed, uh, we tried to make things generic by providing mods-based metadata and other sort of metadata formats. Should you ever want to use these AIPs to move content from DSpace to another system out there, uh, whatever that other system may be. I'm getting a lot of backup noise here. <laughs> if everyone could please mute your personal phone line, unless, of course, you have a question. Okay, we have um, another question, Tim. Do AIP packages preserve a custom non-DC metadata scheme? Uh, yes. Well, they yes, they will preserve um, 
if you have a custom metadata schema inside your DSpace instance, so if you've created a custom schema within DSpace, um, or even custom fields within DSpace, it will preserve that custom metadata schema um, that you've created within your DSpace, as well as any custom fields. Um, it will also recreate those, um, those custom metadata fields whenever you're doing a restoration. Uh, so if you backed up your DSpace and you created a my schema um, in your DSpace that happens to have custom fields, uh, when you restore your DSpace, it will recreate those custom fields for you in an automated fashion. Uh, so it's able to back those up. And as I mentioned, we also just have a generic mods-based um, copy as well there. If you're talking about, about other schemas altogether, um, if, you have, if you use the mods, export capabilities of DSpace, you can actually translate those into mods too, if that makes sense. Any other questions out there? Okay, we have a question. Is there a mechanism to automatically do incremental backups and perhaps also keep old backups sometime? Um, with incremental backups, uh, there's currently not um, an easy way to potential to really. Um, well, actually, let me let me kind of answer this in a couple ways. First off, in one way. There is somewhat of a way that incremental backups happen in a, in a somewhat automated fashion with the replication task suite in that if you are actually backing up content um, via the replication task suite from DSpace, um, if, you, if you were to back up, say, a collection and that collection was already backed up inside your DuraCloud instance, the first thing that will happen when you do that backup is that collections AIP along with all the item AIPs will be generated. And then we'll check to see if those AIPs are identical based on the checksum against the AIPs that are already in your DuraCloud. If they're already identical, we won't even upload them to your DuraCloud. They will just have gotten generated locally and then they'll get removed from your temporary cache because we know that they're already identical up there. Um, so we're only ever uploading stuff to DuraCloud that has actually been changed since your last backup. So in that way, it is kind of a uh, somewhat incremental uh, sort of backup mechanism. Um, but we're always, right now at this point in time, having to generate the AIPs again just to ensure that nothing actually has changed so we can do a, a full comparison of the AIPs. So there's a little bit of a, of a slight difference from normal incremental backups there, if that makes sense. Tim, is the checksum algorithm MDS, AES, et cetera, what are the collision rates? Um, there are MD5 checksums uh, at this point in time, um, but uh, we could always change them to something later, um, something different later on if we found that there was a better sort of algorithm that we felt would be more appropriate. But at this point in time, it's all MD5 checksums. Again, feel free to ask your question live or to paste it in the chat window. Okay, here's a follow-up on the incremental question. Can one, set of the can one set the system to keep obsoleted AIPs for some period? 
Uh, okay, yeah, sorry, I didn't answer that second part of the question I'm realizing, Simeon, sorry. Um, for the, yeah, for actually keeping old backups of AIPs for a period, currently um, the DSpace replication task suite does not have anything built into that yet, um, but I think that would be something that would be plausible to do. Essentially what we'd probably end up having to do, though, is actually performing uh, backups to to different spaces within sort of your DuraCloud account or different sort of locations to actually have different, you know, older archived versions of these AIPs so that you could keep some backups for, say, a month period and others for a week or whatever. Um, so at this point in time, we're really only working against a single backup location. Uh, you could use DuraCloud to actually replicate that backup um, location, that space, off to other sort of uh, storage providers if you wanted extra replication safety, because there's a lot of safety mes um, mechanisms within DuraCloud itself to ensure that that um, content is backed up in multiple ways. But it doesn't actually provide um, this ability to have different backups that are kept for different time periods, at least not yet. So if that's feedback that people feel is very important, then that would be wonderful to, to hear about and we could work on looking at ways to do that. Yeah, I'm just going to make one comment on that, Tim. This is Michelle Kimpton from DuraSpace. Because you have multiple cloud providers available to you in DuraCloud, some of our users are making a primary backup and then a secondary backup, which would be um, the primary would be the dynamic version, and the secondary backup in another cloud would potentially be the static uh, snapshot. So those are some of the use cases being pursued um, through the Dora Cloud uh, application itself. Okay, thank you, Michelle. On behalf of DuraSpace, I would like to thank Tim for presenting to all of you today, and I would thank I'd uh, like to thank all of you for attending this presentation. Um, for more information, Tim has posted um, some information on the slide, and also we will be providing you with an integrated recording of today's event, as well as the screencast that Tim wasn't able to do today. So please look for that information in your inbox soon. And with that, thank you very much, and I wish everyone a good rest of the day.